Greeting students and happy chapter number three in human development. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about genetics, right? A lot of us wonder like, what role does DNA play in who I am? And so let's learn a little bit about that. So do we all have the same genes? How could stem cells help me? Have you heard of stem cell research? Let's talk about that a little. What determines the biological sex of a baby? Is alcoholism genetic? Let's answer these questions. So first of all, let's look at genetics and your genes, right? So all living things are composed of cells, right? And our DNA is really this kind of code, <clears throat> instructions, if you will, um, that help us to develop into the person that we are. Our chromosomes are where our DNA is located. So our instructions, the DNA, is located on these chromosomes. We, most of us, are made up of 46 chromosomes. We have 23 pairs of two for a total of 46 chromosomes, right? What is a genome? A genome is a complete set of our genes or our instructions to copy us or to make us, right? That's a genome, it's a complete set of instructions. An allele is a variation of a gene, right? So anything that's kind of different, right? Among siblings, you know that there's lots of alleles within us. And this is kind of what we're talking about. So let's look at this slide here. So if we look at this slide, we see that we have, you know, a living cell. And inside of that living cell, is this center or nucleus, and inside of that little nucleus is where we have these little, and you see these X's? The X's are the chromosomes. And on those chromosomes is where our DNA is. It's where the instructions, the how to make me kind of stuff is on the actual X chromosomes. And as I said, most of us have 23 pairs for a total of 46 chromosomes. So what is a zygote? A zygote is when two gametes, which is a sperm and an ovum, combine to produce this new individual with 23 chromosomes from each of the contributing parents. Right? So 23 from the sperm, 23 from the ovum to create new life. It is the beginning, really, is what it is. So a zygote is what we call what happens at conception. When we conceive to have a child, we develop or form this zygote. So again, males and females. So humans, again, typically have 46 different chromosomes. We have 44 that we call the autosomes, and we have two that we call the sex chromosomes, which we mean at the 23rd pair, those two chromosomes, we call them the sex chromosomes because whether or not they are X or Y really determines whether or not this baby is going to be male or female. So if we, at the 23rd pair, I myself would have two Xs for female. Right? The male is formed when we have an X and a Y at the 23rd pair. And whether or not or how that pair is determined is based upon the father's sperm, right? So it is the male contributor to this zygote that determines the sex of the offspring, right? Has nothing to do with the female's ovum. Has nothing to do with the female's ovum, which is contrary to what we believe, because if you remember back in the old days, women were actually more or less, um, you know, thought of in a derogatory manner if they did not produce sons because it was their fault. It's, their, it's your fault you're having girls. It's actually the male who contributes this Y chromosome to produce a male child. Okay. So at birth, at birth, newborns have billions of cells. You have just created life. Right? And so we have lots of cells going around in our system. What are stem cells? So stem cells are the first cells that would be in a newborn child, right? They are kind of like the first cells of life. 
those first beginning cells that are fresh and new before environmental toxins or other things can harm our cells as we age, these are stem cells. And why are stem cells awesome? Stem cells are amazing because stem cells are able to produce any other cell in the body. So stem cells could basically, you know, rebuild something. And this is just incredible. So if you had a gallbladder that was, you know, in disrepair or that was um, an organ that was malfunctioning, stem cells could actually help create or fix those complications, right? And stem cells, where do we get them from? We get the majority of our stem cells from embryos, right? And unfortunately, this is the where we run into a problem because most of us who carry a baby for nine months, we want the baby. We are not going to destroy an embryo to get stem cells. So the prime, Primary places that we get stem cells are going to be from miscarriages. They're going to be from um, in vitro procedures that have gone wrong. So we've had discarded embryos because of those procedures, and we've taken stem cells from those embryos. But you can see that we have a dilemma here because we can only get stem cells from embryos. Cord cells. So cord cells, think of them as the runner up or the second best to stem cells. Cord cells can do some really amazing things similar to stem cells. And we get, the place we get cord cells from is actually the umbilical cord, which the umbilical cord is the cord that runs from mom to her baby. That is the way that she is nourishing that baby while the baby is in utero or in her stomach. Um, in her uterus, and it is the way she provides all those nutrients. So it is a lot easier or more accessible than stem cells, right? Um, so let me just share with you, I was really unfamiliar with like what cord cells can do until I was actually expecting my first biological child. So I was 40, I was an older mom um, when I had my first pregnancy and my first child, and so I got some information about a company that said that they could help me to retrieve the cord cells when my daughter was born and save them for her. So I did it, I signed up for it. And what happened is basically, you know, we are gonna discard the umbilical cord and placenta after a birth of a baby. And so you would have thrown it away, but what they do is the nurse actually comes in and she retrieves cord cells from your umbilical cord. And this company, what they do is they cryo-freeze the cord cells that match your child. And so if my daughter were to develop leukemia or any other type of condition as she grows up, one of the place, first places that we would go to would be to retrieve her cord cells from this cryobank because those could be used to actually cure her of many diseases and many different problems. So cord cells are pretty amazing. Um, they don't have all of the amazing properties of stem cells, um, but they're much more accessible in that you could possibly retrieve them during birth and then save them for a later date and time. Right? So again, stem cells and cord cells really, really useful in our research that we have ongoing. So assistive reproductive technology, ARV, ART, sorry, is what we call the umbrella um, of how we're helping couples to conceive children when they can't. So couples that have been unsuccessful in trying to conceive naturally, they will go to look for ART. And the primary form of ART that we're familiar with is in vitro fertilization, IVF. And so here's what IVF is. Okay, so with IVF, what we do is we basically take an egg or eggs from mom, from the female, and think of a Petri dish, and we put her eggs in a Petri dish. We then take either dad's sperm, or if there's a sperm donor, we take sperm and we fertilize these eggs. We want them to grow a little bit, right? And then we're gonna go ahead and take these these eggs that are growing, and we're gonna re-implant them, reinsert them back into mom, or 
possibly a surrogate mom, right? If mom is not able to carry a baby to full term, we would use a surrogate that would be kind of her uterus is being used to house this um, baby growing, right? And so that's what we're doing. So there's some surgery involved, but our, our goal is to assist the couple in um, making sure that, that the, the, the zygote is forming and then re-implanting it back into mom, right? So it says here, half of all IVF babies are low birth weight twins or triplets. And here's the reason why. IVF costs money, costs a lot of money. And so if a couple were to pay to go through the IVF procedure, you know, if you're going to pay $50,000 or whatever it costs to do this, you want to have more than one egg in that basket, right? And so what they're going to do is they're actually going to take several eggs from mom and they're going to fertilize all of them and they're going to re-implant into mom several eggs. And so when you do IVF, you actually sign a consent waiver saying you agree to multiple birth if you have multiple birth. But remember, these couples have struggled with conceiving naturally. So in many of the cases, they would be very happy or fortunate to have a single live healthy birth. Um, yet half of these uh, parents uh, that using IVF are going to have twins or triplets or multiple birth because we implanted multiple eggs back into mom or surrogate um, for more chances to have them be successful. So this is kind of the process of IVF. All right, twins. So whether you are identical twins or fraternal twins, identical meaning that pretty much your genetic makeup is the same. So with identical twins, what happens is you have one egg of mom, one sperm of dad, and that is fertilized. And what happens is that one egg splits into two different eggs. And so the genetic makeup in the two is identical because they came from one egg and one sperm. However, with fraternal twins, it's different. With fraternal twins, what happened is two different eggs of mom and two different sperm of dad fertilize those eggs. And so you have two twins or two, two babies that have some differences in their genetic makeup, just as siblings are different, just as brothers and sisters, right, aren't exactly the same, even though we maybe come from the same parents, right? And so that's what fraternal twins are. And so this is kind of the difference of what's going on to cause that. So why do we have this increased rate of multiple births here in the U.S.? So do you know why the rate of multiple births has increased? If we look at this slide, we're going to see some big changes from 1980 to 2008 here. And we look at these colors. What we're seeing is the rate of triplet or higher births by age group of mom. So we're looking at, if we look at our young moms, the green line moms who are under the age of 25, we see that's been a pretty consistent rate. These moms have not experienced a huge increase in having multiple births, twins, triplets, etc. The one that's really had a huge jump is our 40 year old moms, right? Our moms 40 and over, the orange or yellow line, we've seen a huge jump in those moms. And there's really a couple reasons for that. Number one is gonna be these moms are using IVF. So these baby parents or moms who waited until they were later in their years, they, they waited to finish college, they waited to start a business, they waited to, to start a family and, and be financially prepared. And so they didn't wanna have children till later and then when they started to try to conceive, it wasn't working as well as they would have hoped. And so they started IVF. And so remember we just said with IVF, you have an increased chance of multiple birth, right? And in general, moms over the age of 40 have an increased risk of having multiple births. Their eggs are older. And so that is just one of those consequences of age. And so these are some of the reasons that for this age group, the 40 and over group, there are greater statistical chances of having multiple births. The Human Genome Project's been going on for a long time. Basically, this project um, is a combination of scientists from all over the world who are trying to figure out like, what makes up a human. Like for a human being, what is all of the genetic code? How could we ever make one? What, you know, and that's just fascinating. But 
we've collected all of our data since 2001, almost 20 years ago. However, we still like are trying to figure it out. We're trying to analyze and figure out how is the body so amazing um, that you know we still don't quite have an answer for that. Alcoholism. So is alcoholism genetic? There is a genetic component or basis to alcoholism. Our genes are very powerful. And so what this means is you, if you come from a family where you had relatives that um, were alcoholics, then you have a greater propensity, a greater draw, or a greater desire, or when you drink, it is more challenging to stop drinking than somebody who doesn't have that genetic component. So I come from a family, unfortunately, of alcoholics. My grandfather was an alcoholic, my uncles were all alcoholics, and I grew up in this environment of seeing what alcoholism does to people and families. And so one of the determinations I made as a young person was that I just wasn't gonna drink and I don't drink. And that's because I'm just not gonna really put myself in that situation where I need to fight that. And I knew, I remember what it looked like to see my drunk uncles and to see what that environment was like and I never wanted my kids to have to experience that. And so this is just one of the decisions I've made um, because everyone in my family drinks. And um, there is a definite pull when you come from this genetic trait. Now, does that mean that somebody who comes from a family that does not have an alcoholism problem or alcoholic genetic trait, does that mean that that person cannot become an alcoholic? No. Because we know that socially, if you take an individual who may not genetically be predisposed to alcoholism, but they lose their job, lose their family, lose their home, lose their life, uh, wife, they um, face depression, they go through a series of events that puts them in a place where they turn to alcohol. Can they become an alcoholic? Yes, they can. Yes. And so what we're saying here is both nature, right, the genetic trait and nurture, which is the environmental factors, both of those can play a role in creating alcoholics. And so that's something that you should be aware of. All right, epigenetics, right? We first to environmental factors that really affect our genes. And these are something we're concerned about nowadays because we're finding out a lot more of the consequences of all of the different production, pollution, and all the things that we do in society today. Down syndrome is the most common extra chromosomal abnormality. Now remember I said that um, most of us have 46 chromosomes. Well, what happens with Down syndrome is, remember we said there's 23 pairs of chromosomes. Well, at the 21st pair, somebody who has Down syndrome actually has three chromosomes instead of two. And so this individual has 47 total chromosomes instead of 46. And that is um, a chromosomal abnormality. And we are likelier to have children with chromosomal abnormalities if we're over the age of 40, the older we get. The older we get, the older our eggs are. And so your chances increase exponentially um, in this case. So I think if I remember the statistics correctly, um, 25 and younger, you have like a one in 1200 chance of having a baby with Down syndrome. Um, when we get to 35, you have a one in, 100 chance of having a baby with chromosomal abnormality. When we get to 40, you have a one in, I think, 49 or 50 chance. When we get to 45, you have a one in 10 chance of having a baby with a chromosomal abnormality. So it has nothing to do with dad's sperm, it has everything to do with mom's ova or mom's eggs. Right? So again, it's the correlation of eggs and chromosomal abnormality. What is genetic counseling? Genetic counseling is to assist couples that are trying to conceive a child, yet we're concerned about some family disease or family history. 
So if you have um, some problem, for instance, Tay-Sachs disease. Tay-Sachs disease is particular to individuals of Jewish descent. And what this disease is, it is very, very devastating for the newborn child. But a lot of Jewish people are carriers of Tay-Sachs disease, meaning they don't actually show the symptoms or have the disease, but they carry the gene. And so if you have a mom and a dad, who are both carriers and they come together to create life or to have a baby, then they can pass on that genetic trait to their child of Tay-Sachs disease. So what would happen is this couple would want to go to genetic counseling before they conceive to have genetic counselors do blood tests and take a family history to determine if that's something that we're concerned about. That's genetic counseling. Right, again, Down syndrome means that we have at the 21st pair, we have an extra chromosomal abnormality. All right, and you can read through your slides to kind of make sure that you got the information that we talked about. This was a rather short chapter. We will then see you for chapter number four.